Thank you. Thank you, everyone, from, for coming here. Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to talk about Rust. So <laughs> kind of weird to talk about Rust in a Python conference, but uh, we'll see that uh, it can make sense if we want. And so we'll cover the very basic of Rust, uh, as well um, the interest of building native modules to integrate Rust within Python and not just writing bare Rust code. And as well, the performance improvement that you can have when you're working with Rust within Python. And you can have this uh, in a quite simple way. So first things first, uh, I'm Arthur. I'm from Paris. You probably noticed with my uh, you know, poor accent. <laughs> um, so you can find me on Twitter and GitHub at uh, art049. Um, so I started working in Python uh, something like eight years ago. Yeah, OK. So I started working in Python approximately like uh, eight years ago. And I started working yeah, in embedded systems and building some AI tools for robotic applications. So this is what really got me started uh, in the Python ecosystem. And then I started as well doing some backend development and discovered the uh, fast API. And that's where uh, <laughs> things kind of got uh, off track. And I started working in open source and trying to build uh, my own project because I got so much like uh, power from existing tools that I really wanted to uh, bring something back to the community. So I built the uh, Odemantic, which is a simple ODM for MongoDB uh, based on Pydantic. So we'll come back to Pydantic later because they use Rust as of like one month ago uh, in production. Uh, and then also uh, I'm a typo contributor to CPython <laughs> since uh, probably two months ago. Um, and right now, so as of like last year, I started building CodeSpeed. So it's a tool for continuous performance monitoring. And it makes a lot of sense uh, when you're building some native Rust module. So we'll come back to that uh, later. So how oh, I got started with Rust. So first, like probably a bit more than uh, one year ago, I started with the Rust by example, the Rust links exercise and the Rust book. But it was just like purely theoret theoretical and not really, I mean, applied. And then last Christmas, there was the advent of code. So as probably most of programmers, when I want to learn a new language, I got started with the advent of code. So if you're not familiar with it, it's a set of problems you get around Christmas, one problem every day, algorithmic problems. And you just need to solve them every day to get your stars. And I tried it a few times ago, like with Golang and TypeScript, and I never got it finished. But with Rust, I finally have my Christmas tree, so I was quite happy with it. It took me a lot of time, but uh, finally, uh, I completed one advent of code. Uh, then I worked on some small proof of concept uh, to just uh, get a bit the feel of the language. And later, I, probably four months ago, I shipped my first code to my first Rust code to in production, so I was fairly happy with it, and it works well for now, and it's in code speed. Um, so we're talking about Rust. Um, probably you heard about it. It's the, probably the most loved language. Uh, I think in the Stack Overflow survey, it had been the most beloved language for like seven years. Uh, you probably talk to people and they tell you they program in Rust before even telling you their names or something. <laughs> but uh, it, it, there, is, there are some reasons. And so some pros uh, for the Rust language. So first, it's the performance. So since it's a compiled language, you will get the most out of your CPU. So it has some advantages, but we'll talk about the disadvantages of having a compiled language just later. Uh, then you have the compiler, so as I just mentioned. So I put it in the pros, because uh, as a difference with, like for example, C++ or other compiled language, the Rust compiler is extremely friendly. So it, it can be a bit annoying sometimes. But most of the time, if your code compile, it will work as you expect it to work. So this is a this can be a, a really good point. Then you have memory safety. So if you worked with C or C++, uh, when you have to do some memory allocation, uh, you need to make sure that you are uh, freeing the memory you allocate. Because otherwise, uh, you have a memory leak. And if your program executes for a long time, uh, the, memory will the memory use will just increase, increase, increase. And then your system will crash, or just your program if you're lucky. So this is this has some advantages, but also some downside because with this uh, you get also the borrow checker, 
I won't go in the details about the borrow checker, but uh, probably in the later talks uh, in this room, uh, people will explore this uh, more in depth. And then you have the package manager. So this is probably the reason why we are not having a talk uh, building a native C++ uh, add-ons for Python, uh, because the main difference with other compiled language uh, is that in Rust you have Cargo, which is a, an amazing package manager, and you have a lot of library on crates.io. So in Rust, a package, as we call it in Python, is called crate. So you have a lot of crates for doing many different things, and it's quite close to NPM or PyP for if you if you know. Uh, the, those kind of package managers. And it's way easier than in C++, where, for example, for installing a library, you need first to clone a GitHub repository or copy .h files, and it's, it can be extremely complicated to install an external library. And so now the, the, the cons. Uh, so first, uh, there is a kind of steep learning curve. So that's why I think it's quite good to start uh, by building Rust modules in Python. So it, it takes quite a lot of time to really have a, a decent level so you can write what, some code that do exactly what you want. Um, then again, it's a compiled language, so you have the compilation time and as well some additional CI CD steps, so you need to build your own modules to make sure uh, they are available when your code will run. Uh, so instead of just having a build step with a Docker image, for example, uh, you will need to as well build your uh, REST libraries to use them in Python. And then the compilation time, which can be a bit annoying, but uh, it's not much of an issue. And lastly, um, the verbosity of Rust. So this is why I think it makes a lot of sense to combine Python and Rust. Because for example, um, if we take a simple function uh, to increment a list of integers uh, like this, uh, in Python it's extremely straightforward and you Everything may make some sense just in the business logic uh, term, I would say. So everything is there for a reason in your algorithm. But if you compare it with Rust, uh, it's kind of more verbose. So basically, it, it's the same idea, but you have a lot of specific details. For example, here's the mute, and as well, here uh, the referencing value. And it makes things way more verbose. Uh, because it's a compiled language. So I think it, may, it, it brings a reason for using Rust with some kind of uh, sparseness and not put write everything in Rust. And so that's why use, still using Python for high-level business logic makes sense, while uh, using Rust for some small parts uh, is as well complementary. Uh, so you noticed as well, uh, in Rust, uh, you have some curly braces, so we are not very used to it in, in Python, but uh, it's uh, a trade-off to make, so no more indents. And as well, uh, there is a little crab here, so it's, it's called Ferris, it's a Rust mascot. Um, so why would we use Rust within Python? So as I mentioned, we have kind of the both, of both world. First, we have the expressiveness of Python and its conciseness. And as well, we can use Rust for extremely performance uh, needy uh, part of code. And as well, it makes a lot of uh, sense to do an incremental transition to Rust because probably not a lot of people on a team or on a project know uh, are uh, working with Rust already. So it just brings the capability to build some sub part of the module in Rust. Um, so for this example, uh, we'll try to build uh, a simple graph parser. So the idea is to be able to parse a graph. Uh, so we'll work as well both in Python and then in Rust uh, and see the differences between the two approaches. So the idea is really to parse a graph and it's a huge graph, like a graph with more than 50K nodes. And the idea is to do it in a reasonable amount of time. So we'll, we'll see the performance detail later, but. Uh, uh, the idea is really to work on performance. And so the format, the example format we can take here is a dot graph format. So probably you saw it, I think it can, it can be used in Mermaid and it's used mainly to display graphs, but here we'll just build a simple parser to take this text input and create the graph structure in our code. And so why would we do this in Rust? Because, mainly because um, 
it can take really a, a huge amount of time to pass a, a, a huge graph uh, in Python. And so we'll concentrate on the subset of the dot specification, uh, which is this one. So basically undirected graphs uh, with the names and edge names. Um, so to build a parser, uh, the first, uh, first step will be uh, tokenizing. So it's kind of the same as spelling for word. We'll just extract words and make sure there are words that exist in our language. And then we'll parse this, which means that we'll apply grammar rules to de determine uh, what our graph structure is like. Um, so the tokenizer, um, so first we need to talk about the tokens. So the tokens are basically, as I mentioned, words. So for example, here we have the graph word. As well, we have some identifiers, which are the name, gra the graph name, and as well the name of the edges, uh, of the, the nodes, sorry. As well, we have some edges, so undirected edges. So we're talking about an undirected graph. It's like, for example, uh, if we take back the example, um, we could consider that, uh, for example, uh, it's a graph representing people who shook hands b between them. And for example, it means that A shook his hand with B, uh, and as well B shake a hand with C, and B shake a hand with D. And it's uh, reflexive, so it means if, if B shake a hand with D, D shakes his hand with B as well. Um, so yeah, then we have some semicolons in, the, in those tokens, and as well some brackets. So it's a very simple parser we'll build because uh, it's just uh, an extremely uh, uh, toy example, basically. Uh, so if we want to do this in Python, first to declare our token, we can use an enum. So this enum, for example, will declare like our static tokens. So the ones that are fixed words and can't really vary. Um, then uh, we have a token that is an identifier that have an input actually in, in it. And so for this, I use the data class, so it kind of removes the hassle of building uh, a fully fledged uh, constructor and uh, having this extra verbosity. And then I finally declare a type that is a union of the two. So this is our token, either a basic token, so a member of the enum, or it's an identifier. And so if you want to build this in Rust, it will be an enum as well. But as you can see, uh, we can declare everything in the same enum, and we can have a member of an enum that contains a variable, actually. And so this uh, is a kind of specificity of the Rust language, and it, it's really where it shines, in my opinion, because you can really construct uh, complex compound types and, and mix them together uh, in a simple way. So if you want to talk about compound types, first you have tuple, arrays, and vector. So in Rust, the main difference with Python is that uh, if you have an array, it's fixed size by default because the memory is allocated at the compilation time. So you can't really uh, expand it as you would with a list in Python. And then you have a vector type if you want some dynamic sized array. Um, as well, uh, Rust have a powerful enum system, as I mentioned just before. And so, for example, uh, in Python, you have the known types that allow you to do some optional uh, typings. Uh, but here, in Rust, the option is an enum, and so it's either sum of something or none. So while in Python, for example, it would be a value or none. Here, you have to put sum, and it's a member of an enum. As well, uh, in Rust, uh, I won't talk in depth about error handling, uh, but the error is handled with an enum type as well. So it's either OK of a value or R of an error. So it can seem pretty complicated in the beginning, but uh, actually the Rust language have a, a quite handy syntax to really uh, make some error bubbling and to make it way simple to, to handle errors. And as well, you have struct. So struct is kind of like a class in Python, but it's basically a, uh, a mixing of multiple types. And so for example, here we have a struct that uses an enum, and we can wrap this is an, in an enum of option at the end. So this is yeah, a kind of simple example of uh, how powerful the enum and struct types can be uh, with Rust. So if we come back to our tokens, so we have an enum, 
you know, it should be a bit more simple. And so if we want to uh, convert a word into a token, um, in Python, we can do it with a NIF, ELIF, and ELSE statement. So here, for example, we pass the first or static tokens. And then if it's nothing, we can consider that it will be a dynamic token of an exactly an identifier. Mm, but since Python 3.10, uh, we have the pattern matching. So it makes it a bit more readable. I mean, in this case, it's really exactly like uh, if an elif statement, but uh, you can use the, match, uh, the pattern matching to extract some, some more details, and it's quite close to the red syntax, as we'll see just later. And so out of curiosity, uh, who used the pattern matching in Python here? Okay, okay, great. So for those who didn't use it yet, uh, take care because uh, it's unfortunately not backward compatible. So if you're working with open source software, it might, you, you, you need to wait some time if you want to support uh, Python 3.9 and, and lesser, for example. So we will still have to wait some time for writing that kind of code in open source software. Um, and so in Rust, uh, we have exactly this pattern matching system and it's as well, it can be combined with the struct and enum types. And so it's, it brings uh, something that is extremely close to what we saw in Python. Um, and as well, in the case where we don't match our identifier or um, our token with a, a basic token, we return an identifier. Okay, so now we built our tokens. Uh, we, are, we managed to extract them for, from our graph. And so the next step is really to bring in the grammar. So it might be a bit more complicated, but uh, I will try to make it uh, simple and to skip some steps because uh, it's really not the most interesting part. Uh, so first, uh, if we take back our previous graph, uh, we can just think about it as a sequence of tokens. So as, as described here, and we can try to make it uh, more abstract by just uh, considering that we'll start with a graph token, then an identifier that will be the graph name, then a left bracket, then the definition of our edges, and then a right bracket. Um, inside uh, the node definition, it's actually pretty simple also. Uh, it will just be a sequence of identifiers defining the node name, followed by some edges, and then some identifiers, and then the sequence will be ended by a semicolon. And this can be repeated to create multiple chain uh, of the connected nodes. Um, so this can be represented as a state machine. Um, so we'll see why making a state machine here uh, makes more sense. And so the idea is that this state machine will transition from one state to another by getting one token. And so we have two loops in this state machine. Uh, indicating that, for example, we, have, we can have an unlimited number of tokens uh, of, of node names on a single chain, and we can have multiple chains. So implementing this state machine in Python uh, can be done as well with an enum. So for example, here I just described the states, um, and then I create my state machine. So it's a, I created a class, I put it in the initial state, and then when it receives the token, we use the pattern matching again to transition to a new state. Uh, so for example, here uh, in the start, uh, the start state, we just expect the graph token. So when we get this graph token, we switch to the next state. Um, then we have another step where we get the graph name. So this is this one. And lastly, we, so we, then we have all our other definition of state transition, but I won't list them here. Um, and then in the end, we can handle error case. And that's why uh, building a state machine for this is extremely interesting uh, because we don't have to manually handle each error case and we can just say if we don't match and don't find any, then don't find any state transition, it means that uh, the received tokens are not matching our grammar. And so we can just throw an error like this. Uh, so in REST, it's pretty similar. So we start with an enum, so here there is no uh, variable uh, uh, member. Uh, then we create our struct. So it's kind of a class, but not exactly. So in Rust, you don't have the class and the uh, inheritance things. 
but uh, you have some, you provide some implementation. It works like this. Probably in the next talk, there will be more details about it and traits, or you can just check it out. But yeah, the trade system is a kind of different paradigm, paradigm than uh, the class system. But it's pretty similar. So for example, here we have our constructor. So we create our state machine, initialize it in the start state. And then again, we do some pattern matching. So it's really close to the, our REST code. Uh, here, same, we pass the graph name. So first step was to get the start and the graph token. Then we get our, our names, our graph name. And then we have other state transition. And we'll finish by handling uh, exceptions in just one statement. So again, the benefits of having built a, a state machine. And so are we done? Uh, not really. Uh, so we, we have built our REST code, but it's not yet connected to Python. So that's what we'll see just now. Um, so first, we need to bind our REST function to the Python code. So this can be done with PyO3. So PyO3 is a library providing binding. I mean, it's a, the most popular library providing binding between Python and Rust. So it lets you expose a Rust function to the Python interpreter, and as well, it gives you some control the other way around, but we won't go into those details here. So this is the first step. We need to bind our Rust code to Python. And then we need as well to build our Rust code, because Rust is a compiled language, and the difference with Python is that we need to build it before executing it. So for this, um, the industry standard, I mean, the, the, it has a standard, is to use Matura. Uh, so it's an extremely powerful library allowing you to build uh, Rust modules for Python. You, you have some cross compilation option, I mean, to really have the possibility to support most of the platforms. Um, but in this example, um, we'll use something uh, newer and more useful for proof of concept, which is called Rust import. And Rust import actually is pretty simple. The idea is just uh, on, on top of your Rust file, you mentioned that with a comment uh, that you have Rust import and you're, that you're using PyO3. Then you import PyO3 just here. Then you declare your function in Rust and you put a Py function decorator, kind of. So it's not exactly a decorator, but uh, this is the same idea as in Python. And then you can just uh, import, a I mean, set up the import hook of Rust import, and then you can import your Rust file directly. And it will compile, compile on the fly, and then you can execute it straight uh, without any configuration, and it's extremely easy. So for just prototyping, it can make a lot of sense, and you can really test quickly. As well, you don't have the need for any extra build steps. So for example, if you have a complex CI system, you don't need to add an, an extra step to uh, just build your Rust module and then put it in your image or in your, on your machines. Uh, as well, you can still uh, configure, every, configure everything. Uh, just below the Rust import PyO3, you can specify some additional packages, uh, Rust packages that you want to use, for example. And then you can really easily migrate to Matura when your thing get out of the POC state, I would say. And yeah, the, the migration is really straightforward. Um, so with our code, if you want to do it, first we can declare our graph class. So with a name, a list of nodes, and then the adjacent, adjacency map. Uh, so a hash map is quite close to a dictionary in Python, but this is the name in REST. Um, so this here is a pi class. Uh, then we declare our function, which will just pass the file uh, we provided. Uh, you can see that it's returning a pi result, and this is quite helpful for error handling. So for example, if, as we saw before, you can return either OK of your value or error of your error. And so if you return an error here, it will be converted to an error in Python and it, you, you will be able to catch it, for example. And so, yeah, then we have our function that is combining our parser and our tokenizer. Uh, then the last step, we worked with really hard type in Rust, probably fought with the borrow checker for uh, maybe hours, 
probably if we were luckier, less than ours. And if we just keep it like this, we won't have any typings uh, in our Python code. So it's still quite helpful to just write some type stubs, so a PIY, PI, PYI file, uh, to remind to Python what is the structure of our module. So we just create this parser.py file, and then when we will import our REST module, uh, it will behave uh, with the typing, and it will be very easy to access. As this is not autom automated yet, it has been done for Node.js modules, uh, because then you can generate some typings in TypeScript, but in Python it's not automated yet. Probably it will be done uh, soon. Um, so then we built our module. So what kind of test should we write? Um, there are kind of two different approaches, um, but the easiest one, if you're just learning Rust and uh, getting started, is to write tests in Python. Uh, because it will be some kind of integration testing where you will really test your Rust library. And as well, you will be as close as possible to your Rust code. Uh, if you're working with, for example, teams that know Rust, knows Rust, and don't know Rust, it will be quite easy for them to understand the expected behavior of the Rust code without having to uh, understand the code, actually, because they will be able to see the tests. Um, so here, we can just write a simple test file with, for example, PyTest. Uh, we just have our import hook at the top. So when we import our parse file function, it will get compiled on the fly. Um, then we define our test. And here, for example, we import a graph that is undir dot dot. And it has a length of four, four nodes. And we just check that the nodes are actually the, the one we set in the graph. And so th this should compile quite easily. Uh, and it will pass, but what if we should? We, what if we could measure performance in the same same time? Uh, so measuring performance is quite hard because it really depends on your hardware. Uh, it depends on what software is running in parallel on your machine. So it's extremely complicated. But if you're working with Rust uh, and you're working to improve your performance, it makes quite a lot of sense to measure it because if you're not measuring it, then why really bothering improving performance? So the idea is really to put this as a benchmark and to kind of shift left performance testing and doing it during kind of unit testing instead of putting it at the end of the chain. So with PyTest code speed, for example, you can just turn your previous test at a fixture and so you will keep your unit test and it will become a benchmark on top of that. So if you run PyTest without uh, any benchmarking stuff, it will work fine, it will just uh, check your assertion, but if you run it with the benchmark flags, then it will turn this in a benchmark and it will measure only the parse file function and uh, get you some exact timings. And it's also compatible with uh, PyTest benchmark and also PyTest speed for, from Samuel Colvin. Um, and this new syntax as well is supported thanks to Patrick Arminio, uh, who did a PR uh, probably last week, so thanks to him for, for this contribution. Um, and so if we have a look to the performance, um, we can see that there is quite a lot of difference. So here we have the times that it's taken to pass a graph of different size. So we start with 200 uh, nodes and we get to 50K nodes. Um, so the, so it, it really, so the, the number, the, the time should be uh, the less, the less, the lower the better. Um, we can see that we have kind of a time 20 improvement just by having a, uh, our compiled Rust module and we didn't do much. We just literally translated our Rust code, our Python code to Rust and just wrapped a subset of our module. Um, and so this has been measured uh, using CodePeed. So the idea is really to uh, do the performance measurement continuously and before deployment. So I think this is extremely important because if you just measure it when it's deployed, then it will harm your users and probably you don't want that and you want to catch performance regression early on. So the approach uh, CodeSpeed had is uh, based on instrumentation, which means it's more reliable than time-based measurement and especially more stable. 
which means you won't have some crazy variants, even if you're running in extremely noisy cloud environment or GitHub action, for example. Uh, as well, it's in completely integrated like, like CodeCov uh, to your pull request and CI uh, workflows. And lastly, it's free from open source, so if you want to try it out uh, and give us some feedback, it would be awesome. So let's talk about Rust in Python project and people we did some, already did some uh, crazy integrations that are working and used by uh, many people. So first there is Pydentic, so it's a data, data validation library, so if you didn't hear about it, I think there is a talk uh, in this conference, but you should definitely check it out. Uh, it's something that really contributed to uh, the API development ecosystem. It really empowered Fast API and uh, completely transformed the way you develop in Python. I mean, I couldn't build a project without Pydentic. And since uh, one month, they released Pydentic v2, and it used Pydentic core, which is a Rust module, which is using Rust module for Python, and it really uh, empowers the data validation and make it as quick as possible. Uh, as well, another example is Robin. I think uh, Sanskar is as well here. It's a web framework with a REST runtime, and it's built uh, almost like a fast API, but since it has a REST runtime, it's as well quite faster than uh, regular just async Python. And as well, uh, there is another project called TS Down Sample, uh, which is a uh, time series down sampling algorithm for visualization. And those three projects are using CodeSpeed to track their performance improvement, and uh, it, it helped them already to improve and check out their performance. So if, yeah, if, you, if you didn't know about this project, I really highly recommend you to check it out. As well, it's interesting to see how they did the integration and what configurations they used with Matura. Um, so if we dive into the Pydantic example, um, the initial speed up was about, uh, 16 time, so which is quite a lot, uh, just by bringing Rust code. So it's an average, and def depending on the path and the operation you're doing, the speed up is different. Um, and they are still working on performance improvement more, and they are, for example, with PGO. So PGO is like profile-guided optimization. It's like telling the Rust compiler uh, which execution path to optimize. So it's kind of advanced, but it's just a possibility to go even uh, further in performance optimization, and I think they are really on the right path. Uh, as well, it's really kind of cascaded to other, um, other libraries using Pydantic. So for example, home types, which is uh, that data class library uh, for biological Im imaging was using Pydantic, and their migration to Pydantic v2 just brought 75% performance improvement. So this was really like, uh, this Pydantic uh, new release really has a huge impact on the whole ecosystem and all the machine using Pydantic at scale. Uh, and it's really, I think, uh, good for the environment. Um, so yeah, uh, so here are my socials. Uh, I'll put the code and everything working uh, a bit later this week. Um, as well, uh, just uh, come and chat with us. Uh, we are here with Adrien, my co-founder for CodeSpeed, and would be really happy to chat with you about performance, for example. And as well, you can check out CodeSpeed, so it's free for open source projects. And thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur, for this really interesting talk. We have time for a bit of Q&A, and we have a microphone in the middle of that. So if somebody wants to ask a question, please get to the microphone, and you can ask the question. Uh, before we get to that, uh, so give you some time if somebody wants to ask a question to get up there, uh, let's just remind the other audience the Pydantic talk that you recommended uh, visiting is in the other room over there in the South Hall a, this afternoon, directly after lunch at uh, 14 o'clock. So if you're interested in Pydantic, you can see that there. Now let's have another close look in the round if there is a question that somebody would... Yes, please go to the microphone at the back, and then you'll have the ability to ask it. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, what about uh, if you need to distribute your... Um, uh, 
your code for all possible uh, operational system like Windows, Linux, uh, how it works. Thank you. Uh, so it can be done uh, with Maturan. So with Rust import, it's a bit more complicated. I mean, it, it's probably doable because uh, it's compiles, uh, it compiles when you import the module directly. Uh, but then you would need to have all the Rust tool chain on every machine that will use the project. So it's kind of complicated. But the easiest way is to use Maturin and do some cross compilation or, or just do the compilation on various architectures for Windows, Mac, Linux. And yeah, this can be a kind of downside of building a Rust module instead of just a pure Python module. But uh, the performance benefit uh, is the upside. So. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we can have another question, if you have one. Yeah, so as you're probably aware, there's a lot of uh, things you can mix in Python that promise performance improvements due to switching in native code, just-in-time compilation, all kinds of things, yeah. right? So in your opinion, um, your alternative that you proposed, Rust in Python, what is like the main reason that you would choose this over any of the alternatives already in place or coming up? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, yeah, totally, and actually, I think we, there is a kind of uh, release, I, I'm not really aware of the name, but uh, I think with uh, starting with 3.11, it's really some performance release with the C Python core. So it, it will be extremely interesting to see how it evolves and the performance improvement it can, it can bring, such as, for example, uh, with the Node ecosystem and V8, V8, for example, which really highly optimize the code. Um, so I think there are yeah, a lot of alternatives but in my opinion, uh, building Rust code is the most uh, first enjoyable one, but it's really a personal opinion. Um, and as well, uh, it brings you memory safety, which is, uh, I mean, to me it's really invaluable because you don't really have to think about freeing your memory. So if you allocate a lot of, for example, a huge arrays or I don't know, you don't have really to, to think about it. And as well, yeah, you have the Rust ecosystem, which is probably the kind of killer feature which really brings you a lot of uh, uh, traits, uh, and it's extremely interesting because, for example, if you're working with C++ or things like this, it will be much harder to install li libraries and to get some upgrades, but that's also a bit of personal opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We also have remote questions. So we have a question, how does Rust compare to Cython? Yeah. Cython being able to that you can write your C code. Uh, and have that compiled fastly. How oh, fast it is? The, the difference in performance or in... Well, it's the, the reward question that I can't uh, okay. come to. So basically, just a comparison, should I like learn Rust or should I go the C Python way? Yeah. The Cython way. So probably it's... Uh, the performance is likewise because uh, Rust actually uses um, uh, LLVM uh, under the hood, so which is a kind of intermediate language before going to assembly. And for example, with C code, you can go through the same path. So actually, even if you code in Python, it, the performance will be li very likely uh, to be the same. Um, but I think really, yeah, the upside is that uh, Rustcom is with a strong compiler uh, that really is really friendly. Well, if you're working with C, for example, uh, it won't be as friendly, and you might have some headaches uh, fixing compilation issues. OK, thank you. Uh, let's have the next question, please. Yes, you mentioned um, Fast API and yes. Robin. Yes. Have you compared those two performance? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> but I think, <laughs> but uh, I, I think there are some comparison on the Robin uh, website, and I think it's at least five times faster. So I, I don't really know the internals of uh, Robin, but uh, I think Sanskar is here. So if you <laughs> if, if you can find him, it would be probably a good question to ask him. Thank you. We have a few more minutes time, so if you would like to ask your next question, please. Yeah, hello. Uh, so what happens if you import the, the Python module uh, or the Rust module? Is it recompiled every time you import it in the script? And what happens if you get a compilation error? Yeah, uh, so yeah, if, if you get a compilation error, unfortunately, you will get a runtime error in Python. So that's the downside of it. While with Maturin, it's uh, some external build, which means that you will get just a build error. Uh, and then there is a, an interesting cache system set up in Rust import that will avoid to recompile the module every time. And as well, you can also specify some additional flags. So for example, if you want some high optimization and a release build, 
you can specify it in the Rust import tool. And as well, uh, Rust import allow you to do some uh, offline compilation, kind of. So when you import your library, you won't have to compile it on the fly. Okay, thank you. Thanks, let's have the next question, please. Uh, yeah, I would like to ask about the performance. Is it always that the Rust is like 20, 15 times faster than Python? Or are there examples where it doesn't really make such a difference, like, I don't know, web scrapping or connecting the database? Uh, yeah, so yeah, for example, for connecting with database, probably the bottleneck is not really around Python. So it's probably the database that might be the bottleneck. But as well, uh, yeah, if, for example, if you're working with huge IOs and you're b bringing them from Python to Rust, uh, there might be some overhead because the memory needs to be transferred from one to another. So I don't know if you want to send uh, one gigabyte or something like this to Rust. Uh, you might have to think to other alternative and uh, just think about the path of the data to try to optimize it. So yeah, there are some cases where it's not really interesting to, to do this. And one more question. Are there any IDs that you can use to program in Rust? For example, Python, does it have support to Rust? Uh, an ID, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I use uh, VS Code. There is a, a quite nice extension. I think it's available in all languages called Rust Analyzer. And you can turn on, so I can show the example here, but you can have some uh, inline types, which is extremely helpful, for example, if you're chaining a lot of Rust statements, it will give you the type of each statement, and it's quite helpful yeah, if you have some, for example, functional programming and you're chaining map, reduce, and stuff like this. So yeah, with VS Code, it's quite handy, and there is quite a lot of documentation with this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. We have another of the remote question. Uh, you mentioned Robin, and the question is, how mature is the Robin ecosystem compared to fast API or Flask? Uh, yeah, uh, so I think Robin is maybe newer, so probably a bit less. I'm not an expert in the Robin ecosystem, but uh, I think it's, it's still pretty stable, and you can build some small microservice with it and just experiment. And just, this is the same idea as with uh, uh, building Rust module. You can just create a subset of your whole project and try the, the performance of the, of the API, for example. So you would trust it for production use? Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. Totally. So we have time for like one or maybe two short questions, so please ask your question. Is it possible to use uh, code speed for pure Rust applications as well as like Python extensions? Yes, yes, totally. So, uh, but you need to build your benchmark with um, uh, Criterion, which is the standard for Rust. Uh, but here, it's in, since you're, if you're working with Python, it's way easier to just build everything in Python. I mean, the testing and everything. Okay, and one more final question, please. So, uh, does the memory safety only affect the Rust side, or it interacts with the memory manager with Python in some way? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I think. For the Rust part, where you allocate memory, it, it will be safe because it's handled by Rust and the compiler. So every memory that is allocated will be freed. Um, but the interaction with, for example, if you have some memory leaks within Python directly, um, I don't think it can really help for other parts of uh, C Python, for example. OK, thank you. OK, so that's everything we have time for now. Thank you very much for presenting this for us so that more people get interested in that.